Hi everyone, welcome to The Third Eye and in this episode we'll be looking at banks, the small cap index, a specialty chemical company very briefly and an equally special fund manager, the one and only Saurabh Mukherjee. Let's start with the banks, actually public sector banks which have together delivered a combined profit of 33,643 crores in quarter two of this financial year, which is a good 31% jump over the last year. The leader of this growth pack is PNB Punjab National Bank that reported an year-on-year -year rise of 327% which was followed by the Central Bank of India who did an amazing job with the gross NPA and then the Union Bank of India that posted a 90% growth in net profits thanks to a 28% improvement in its net interest income. In fact, on a half yearly basis, the 12 PSU banks posted a net profit of 68,000 crores which is 66% higher than what the banks delivered last year. Expectedly, these stocks have had a good run-up with four of them doubling in price over a an year and every stock barring BOB and SBI having delivered a price appreciation of at least 30% in the last six months. As expected, many brokerages have come up with buy recommendations which is quite a turnaround in fortunes when I look back at where the sector was just a few years back with the lowest point coming in FY18 when the public sector banks reported combined losses of over 85,000 crores. Point blank, PSBs have come a long way, but the past is the past, and as investors, a larger part of our focus has to be on the future. So let's focus on the biggest element in a bank's profitability, which is the net interest income. And as we can see here in the case of SBI, the NII contributes a solid 80% of the bank's operating profit. In fact, as a sector, including private and public, our friendly or not so friendly neighborhood bankers generated a little over 1,90,000 crores of net interest income in the previous quarter alone. If you're not sure what NII is or some other term like gross NP, etc., then I suggest you watch my video on the banking sector where I've analyzed 11 different metrics that one needs to know and understand when evaluating any bank. Okay, back to NII or more specifically the NIM, that is the net interest margin, which simply put is the difference between the interest a bank earns on the loans given and the interest that needs to be paid out to depositors and lenders. So the NIM number is basically the profit and therefore an indication of how well a bank can generate income from the lending activities compared to the cost of acquiring funds. Now, if you track back with what's happening with interest rates, about 15-18 months back, interest rate on fixed deposits were extremely low while the loan rate charged by these banks was not that low. This allowed banks to make higher margins, with the NIM improving just about every quarter for every bank in FY23. But the music has to eventually stop, right? And I'm sure you would have noticed your FD interest rates going up in the last year or so which essentially means the bank's cost of acquiring funds has gone up as well. And with the interest rates peaking, it means there's going to be some compression in NIM numbers over the coming one or two quarters. In fact, there was much speculation that there would be a NIM compression of 10, even 20 basis points in this financial year's second quarter itself. And while different banks have shown different deltas, the overall projection by the end of the year is a slight dip in the net interest margin. And in general, this will be around the 3, 3.1% mark. At this stage, it's important for me to mention HDFC Bank was NIM came down from 4% to 3.6% in the last quarter, which was purely on account of the merger which led to liquidity buildup and also the ICRR requirements. If you're wondering what ICRR is, it stands for Incremental Cash Reserve Ratio, which is something the RBI mandated in August of this year to address the surge in liquidity in the country's banking system following the return of 90% of 2000 rupee notes. You can read more about it on the internet and while it is expected that this ICRR will completely go away in this quarter, this blocking of funds did have an impact on every bank's NIM. But in the overall scheme of things, with the RBI pausing a further increase in repo rates and with the deposit rate likely to take a few more months before it normalizes, there are many analysts who believe that NIMs for the banking sector have peaked and will most likely reverse over the coming two quarters. But having said this, the NIM is just one metric and there are a number of other variables which seem to have hit the right note when it comes to India's banking sector. For instance, asset quality is something to be proud of with gross NPAs already hitting a decadal low of 3.9% as of March of this year with positive indications that this can go down even further. Similarly, the PCR, another term we came across in my banking video, 
The provisioning coverage ratio is at an all-time high of 75%, which translates to a correction in credit costs, which is likely to drop to 0.7%. When it comes to NII with credit growth expected to be around 15% on a YOI basis, one can expect the NII to grow. However, for the coming quarter or two, this might be subdued or even flat due to NIM pressures. And finally, there's profitability in the form of ROA, that's the return on asset. And as it stands, the banking sector ROA is at a 10-year high of 1.1%. However, I did come across this one article wherein McKinsey expects the ROA of Indian banks to decline over the next two, two and a half years to an estimated range of 0.8 to 1%, which is due to a contraction in net interest margins caused by repricing of deposits. So to put this all together, for many quarters, the loan book has been expanding. There is an improvement in asset quality. Profitability has gone up. And while the margins have gone up until now, it seems the banking net interest margin cycle has caught up with us. And it's definitely something one has to think about if you're already invested into banks or are exploring getting into one. My second big story of the week is ironically on small caps and the nifty small cap 250 index is now at its all time high having delivered a little over 32% in returns in the past six months. Of course, it wasn't a straight up run, but in spite of that small blip last month, the index and most of the actively managed schemes in the small cap category have continued to do well. Now, I will try to address these in and I'll try to address these in a brief snacky format. So question number one is, are small caps currently expensive? And the first clue comes from the fact that some AMCs like Nippon India and Tata Mutual Fund have or had temporarily halted taking in lump sum investments in their small cap scheme. According to the fund house, there were two major reasons for this, which includes the potential illiquidity if something goes wrong. That is, the fund is not able to find buyers in the market. And of course, the difficulty in deploying additional capital on account of high valuation and therefore a lack of opportunities. I think this was in June or July of this year, and you can see some retail madness in action here, wherein as the index kept moving up month on month, so did the amount of inflow into these schemes, which is one sign that the category is hotting up. So there is some conjecture in what I'm saying, which brings me to a more data oriented question number two, that is what is the universally trusted valuation metric, the P ratio saying about all this? Now, I have to tell you, extracting the P multiple of the small cap 250 index was not an easy task, but after matching data from Nifty indices and other sources, this chart here looks the most accurate and the recent three months is where the index has been the most expensive. But again, as investors, we aren't as much interested in historical P as we are with the forward P ratio and in a presentation by Baroda BNP AMC, I found this chart that seems to suggest that the forward P even now is midway between the long term mean and one standard deviation, which is another way of saying that the small cap index is probably not overvalued, but it's definitely not undervalued. And expectedly, the third and final question any investor is likely to ask is, what can I do in such a scenario? So there are a few approaches I can think of, and it's very likely that you might already know a few of these. So number one, substantial allocation to small caps should be avoided. And I say this not only from a decline in share price perspective, but also from a liquidity perspective, because given their low trade volumes, it's definitely possible that you might end up in a situation wherein you're not able to offload all your small cap shares and even your fund house might find it difficult to sell shares at the optimum price. So in case your portfolio already has too much of small cap in it, maybe now's a good time to rebalance it and get your portfolio asset allocation right. And a bunch of suggestions are already available in a previous video. Approach two is in terms of investing. And personally, I don't see any problems in continuing one's SIPs, but you most definitely should avoid investing lump sum money. And this 10 year rolling return chart is good proof of that, wherein lump sum investments in the nifty small cap 250 index have seen a meandering performance course. And this gets even more highlighted when I compare it with the nifty 50. This timing issue is not that visible with the SIP approach. And as I've always suggested, your core wealth creation strategy technique should be equity SIPs and everything else. So the remaining 20 odd percent should be looked at tactically. And the third consideration is to substitute investing in small caps with something that's more relatively undervalued, which in this case are the large caps. And there are a couple of interesting points to look at. 
The first is the flow of money and after five consecutive months of net outflow, the large cap category of funds seems to have finally turned a corner as it garnered over 700 crores in net inflows in the month of October. The last time it had a net inflow number was in April of this year. So in that context, this is a significant event for this category. The second variable to look out for are the valuations. And there's an interesting chart that Sanco Securities had put out a couple of weeks ago, where they featured a BSC Sensex to BSC small cap index ratio and noted the fact that this ratio had plunged to a 15 year low of 1.7, which is something we have seen previously in January of 2018 and also in September of 2010. In both these occasions, the Sensex managed to make big gains over the next few months and it's a cycle that seems to be repeating itself every few years. The data suggests that there's an opportunity now to accumulate more of large caps via stocks, ETFs or mutual funds rather than investing in small caps. It's an interesting article to read up on and a link to that has been provided in the video's description. The third segment before I get into this week's question is more of a homework for you and something I observed while reading the latest earnings transcript of Gujarat Fluorochemicals Limited. Please recall this company is into fluoropolymers and is counted amongst the world's top five companies in this space and I believe I had made references to it in my video on the specialty chemical sector. So when I was reading the transcript, a line caught my eye. I think this was page three and it said the last quarter has been unprecedented for us when performance has been impacted in all three business segments, namely bulk chemicals, fluorochemicals and fluoropolymers. And these were all for different reasons which got coincidentally hit at the same time. I mean, this is real bad luck and as a consequence of external factors, the company's sales fell by 35% on a year-on-year -year basis and the net profits took an 85% dive. But surprisingly, this hasn't made a dent in the company's share price, which I'll take up in a different discussion. So when I look at the sales and profits, and to cut a long story short, with regards to the bulk chemical business, GFL's revenues were almost flat and the drop in profitability was due to a drop in prices. The fluorochemical segment was the primary reason for the big fall in GFL's profits and was due to a drop in the company's domestic and export volume of their R125 refrigerant. And thirdly, in terms of fluoropolymers, there was dumping activity by China and Russia in low-end grades of PTFE, wherein the prices saw a sharp decline and simultaneously volume pickup in the high-end grades suffered due to continued destocking and sluggish demand in the US and European markets. Now, if you want to get into the nitty gritties of each, and I hope you are curious about this, then do pull out this financial year's Q2 earnings call transcript from the company website and study it over this weekend. I'm sure you'll learn a lot from this. All right, in this final part of today's episode of The Third Eye, I want to take up an interesting question where the viewer is asking how Saurabh Mukherjee justifies investing in a company that's available at a P ratio of 100 or more, but is consistently compounding at 20%. The question is on mathematics of it, but having said this, I really don't think Mr. Mukherjee is trying to justify or unjustify the price of a business, but he's merely trying to give us an alternative structure of thinking. Anyways, let's look at this and assume there's this company which is expected to be valued at a PE of 50 on a very long term basis and is currently being offered at a PE of 100. The other important piece of information is that the company has enough in it to grow its sales, profits and cash flows at 20% per annum for let's say the next 10 years. So to keep it simple, if the company is available at 100 rupees, then going with a price earning multiple of 100, the initial year profit is 1 rupee. At 20%, this number grows to 1 rupee 20 paise at the end of one year. 1.44 in year 2, 1.73 rupees in year 3 and so on. And assuming a linear growth, the profit number at the end of the 10th year will show up as 6.19 rupees. Now, since we paid 100 rupees for this company, which means in the 10th year, the P ratio based on the initial acquisition price is 100 divided by 6.19, which comes to 16.2. Also remember I said in a simplified version that the company or perhaps the sector is expected to work on a perpetual P ratio of 50 which means the expected 10th year stock price is 50 multiplied by 6.19 which comes to 309 rupees. So effectively this gives us a 10 year CAGR of 12% which is my version of justifying a high P ratio for a fast compounding company. 
Of course, I have no idea if Mr. Mukherjee and Marcellus thinks it the same way. But just as a mathematical exercise, here's one way in which the company that's doing well but is twice as expensive can justify its value to a prospective investor. If you have a different understanding of this question or a different thesis, then do let me know in the comments box below and I sincerely hope you learned something new and informative from this episode. As always, thank you for your time. Do like this video. Do subscribe to my channel. Do let your friends know about this and I'll be back next week with yet another episode of The Third Eye. Until then.